Welcome everyone to the 23rd annual Be Your Own Boss Bowl. We'd prefer to be in person with a packed audience today, but we're delighted to have everyone joining us virtually. It's been a particularly difficult year for small businesses, and yet also it's a, it provides some extraordinary opportunities for true innovators and problem solvers. We're proud of the many recent successes of our Temple Made Ventures, including this past year, FDA approvals received by companies such as Lea Diagnostics and Stratus Labs, as well as recent funding obtained by Get a Car and Simply Good Jars during a recent visit on Shark Tank. We believe the companies you'll be hearing from today will be some of the next new Temple Ventures making the news in the near future. Despite these challenging times, we had interest to this year's competition from over 160 teams representing 10 different schools and colleges within the university. And we're delighted to see this competition continues to reflect not just the diversity of ideas, but also of our entrepreneurs here within the Temple community. This year, four finalists competing in the undergraduate track and four in the upper track for graduate students, alumni, faculty, and staff. We'll be awarding first through fourth places and a crowd favorite award based on your votes during the live event today. And of course, the grand prize. For those of you in the audience, please make sure you have your cell phones handy to help choose the winners of the $1,000 crowd favorite award. Remember to visit yourn.com slash BYOBB slash 2021 during or at the end of the presentations and vote for your favorite. If you're tweeting, don't forget to use our hashtag at hashtag BYOBB21. Finally, we'd like to acknowledge everyone who submitted to the competition this year and all the friends and family joining us today to support our eight finalists. We hope that you'll join us after the live event as well on the Remo platform for some live networking with the eight finalist teams. They would love to have you join us you can congratulate them and ask them questions about their venture. And we hope that some of you watching today will be inspired to start your own entrepreneurial journey and find out how we in the IEI can help you achieve your goals. Enjoy our short intro to the IEI, and then we'll have Provost Joanne Epps sharing some welcome remarks with us. Thank you. For more than 20 years, the Innovation Entrepreneurship Institute has supported entrepreneurs across Temple University. And our mission is to serve all students, alumni, faculty, and staff from all 17 colleges across the university. We're here to help support them in their entrepreneurial journeys. The Be Your Own Boss Bowl has always been kind of the culmination of our programming for the year. We were able to do the Be Your Own Boss Bowl last year completely online, and I think it was a big success. It's a critical event where we give away a fair amount of funding, and that funding is really valuable to help our students launch their dreams and turn them into reality. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Stanton, and I'm the co-founder of SwitchStream. We've been involved with the Be Your Own Boss Bowl since 2013. It has been so helpful in jumpstarting our entrepreneurial success. We are just so elated and excited to have won the grand prize and be able to um, take our company to the next level. I'm Will Bubinick and I'm the founder of Nebula Media Group. I had a very big vision and a very big idea of what I wanted, but not necessarily a roadmap to get there. So the IEI was able to lay that critical foundation and that pillar to help get me from, from zero to one. I'm absolutely ecstatic for what the future is going to hold. Not only do we offer courses, you know, curriculum to support students on their entrepreneurial journey, but we also offer all of these great programs. So it starts off with an Inspire event where we try to bring people in, make them aware of the competition, but also inspire them to participate. Then we offer a series of workshops, pitch coaching, fantastic mentoring support, and uh, it's amazing to see how they take that feedback and then have a much stronger presentation and come into the Be Your Own Boss Bowl and win it. All of the feedback is just super helpful in, in getting you in the right direction, putting you in a better position to 
you know, progress further with your company. Just meeting with people that know so much about the industry and have so many good connections, it's been invaluable. Regardless of how we do in the actual competition, just having gone through this process uh, is immensely powerful and helpful for our business going forward. Hey guys, my name is Javier Zamora. I'm the founder of Andy's Gloves. They provide a lot of, of tools and networking and um, and it does help people, let's say, move forward into the company they want to build and they're dreaming of, of creating an idea they want to, to make a reality, you know? It's so exciting and satisfying to see our students succeed, see our alumni succeed. That's extremely satisfying and fulfilling for us. All of us feel that we make a real impact because we see jobs getting created. We see whole new business models being explored and industries changing. And all as a result, frankly, of uh, Temple students and alumni getting out there and driving through the impact that they want to drive. Congratulations to all the, the featured entrepreneurs out there. This is the year for you. I can feel it, I can smell it. But you know, at the end of the day, this is just the beginning and it's so critical and important to, to go through this process and wish everybody the best of luck and uh, you know, looking forward to, to seeing what comes of all this. Hi everybody, I'm Joanne Epps, and I couldn't be happier to be part of the group launching this year's Be Your Own Boss Bowl. What a wonderful rite of passage this is in the spring that I always look forward to attending in person. So I'm sorry once again to be sending remarks from a distance, but it is necessary. And I know that all of the best parts of this competition will be available to all of us, even virtually. I wanna thank our students for their participation there are people who've looked at the world and seen a need, something that could be fixed, something that could be better, and have applied their talents and intellect toward problem solving, something very much needed in this world. So I wish our competitors success. I wanna thank our judges. I wanna thank all of you who are in attendance and to sit back and enjoy what I know is going to be a wonderful, wonderful competition. Thank you, Provost Steps. I want to thank our panel of judges who reviewed the, pre the finalist presentations and also participated in some pretty intensive Q&A with our, our teams. Their varied experience and perspective made for a well-rounded panel this year. A special thank you to Chad Butler, Senior Manager and Technology Innovation at Comcast, Corey Crawford, Director of Financial Operations at Greenfire. Philip Harigi, Chairman, CEO, and Founder of Sabre Systems. Olivia McPherson, Program Manager of JPOD at Philadelphia at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, last but not least, Tim Rowe, Director of Rev1 Ventures. I'm pleased to share that all are Temple alumni. All our judges look for businesses with realistic and marketable ideas and a sound strategy and revenue model with potential for growth. You'll also be hearing some comments from our judges later in the program, um, and we'll, we'll see what they have to say. Now it's my pleasure to share with you the following one minute elevator pitches, which we asked the teams to do in addition to the nine minute pitches that the judges heard. And remember to vote for your crowd favorite at yorn.com slash BYOBB slash 2021. And you can vote during and after the, the uh, pitch videos or before the final deadline of voting, which is going to be at 520 today. My name is Glennon Crawford, and I'm the founder of Bobby Secured. Bobby provides short duration, customized safety solutions. 
but we call it a la carte security. Bobby was born from the idea that everyone deserves to be safe. Bobby is an affordable way to connect agencies to users with the convenience of an application. Security is expensive. Large security companies are inflexible and small security companies lack scalability. Bobby aims to help bridge the gaps of all size security companies and connect them with people that want to feel safe. As the founder and visionary behind Bobby, I bring my military and civilian experience in the world of safety to provide a unique solution to the current climate in America. As the world feels more unstable and people want to mitigate risk, Bobby Security can help users find more peace of mind. Our value comes from catered, cost-effective safety solutions for all people. I hope you enjoyed this short graphic novel, and I am honored to be a finalist in 2021's Be Your Own Boss Bowl. Hi, I'm Emily. I'm Caroline, and we are the co-founders of the Duo Case by the Sun and Star Collective. Are you ever carrying around two pairs of glasses, but don't want to carry two bulky cases? So if you end up carrying them freely, causing damage to your glasses, such as scratched lenses or broken frames? Well, that's why we created the Duo Case, a double eyeglass case that securely holds and protects your two pairs of glasses. Its innovative spline design provides compact convenience in one case, our case is the same size as your average sunglass case and can carry two pairs of glasses, from small reading glasses to large frame sunglasses. Made out of cork leather and bamboo, the duo case is sustainable, antimicrobial, and water resistant. We also have a social impact mission with the nonprofit Vision Spring. With every case purchased, 5% of sales will be donated to provide affordable eye care to those in need. The duo case combines convenience, stylish sustainability, and social impact all in one case. Invest in us to make our vision and others' vision a reality. Hi, my name is Brian, and I am presenting our company, JoJo, the future of bubble tea. There are many inconveniences within the boba tea industry. These include traveling far for good boba tea, getting boba tea made from powder, no thanks, and not being able to get boba whenever we want. Not to mention, boba teas are quite expensive, with final pricings ranging from six to seven dollars. We are here because we believe in a future where quality boba is accessible, consistent, and affordable. Jojo is an automated boba kiosk operating 24 seven, serving quality boba made with fresh ingredients. Under two minutes for $5. The kiosk serves four types of bubble tea, hot or cold, with the ability to customize for dietary needs. Hi, I'm Brian, and I am the CEO of JoJo. Hi, my name is Dennis, I'm the CTO of JoJo. Hi, my name is Francis, and I'm the COO of JoJo. We are the future of bubble tea. <laughs> My name is Eric Yu, and I'm Dan Fantando, and we're the co-founders of Koi Charging. Keeping your devices charged shouldn't mean having to lug around an assortment of cables and adapters. That's why we've created the Koi Flip, the first ever laptop case with a built-in wireless charger. The Qi-enabled wireless charging pad uses your laptop's internal battery to charge your mobile device. Perfect for commuters looking to get work done on the go, or for your next coffee shop business meeting because good luck finding a charging outlet in any cafe. And for college students dealing with confined spaces, like those impossibly small lecture hall desks, we've got you covered. Just enable the Koi Flip's latch, and the charging pad will lock into place, supporting the full weight of your phone. It flips out when you need it, and tucks away when you don't. So who's ready to flip and take charge with us? All right. <laughs> okay, we can cut that right now. So now it's time. All of our undergraduate teams propose businesses to consumers Mod using a business to consumer model, solving real world, world problems for their target markets. Now for the winners in the undergraduate track. In fourth place, the winner is 
Glendon Crawford with Bobby Security. Congratulations, Glendon. In third place, the winners are Daniel Cantando and Eric Yu with Koi Charging LLC. Congratulations, guys. In second place, the winners are Emily Madera and Carolyn O'Keefe with Duo Case by the Sun and Star Collective. And that means that the winners, first place for the undergraduate track, the winner is Brian Huang, Dennis Josipi, and Francis Duong for JoJo. Brian, would you like to say a few words? Definitely. Can you hear me? Yeah. Well, I just want to say that this has been a tremendous experience for me with multiple reviews and multiple iterations. Um, I am very grateful of IEI for this opportunity um, to compete in this competition. I'm very grateful for all of the open mentors on Startup Tree, uh, my friends and family, and not and definitely my team. Um, thank you so much for your support. You're welcome and congratulations to the entire team. All right, now we're going to watch the full nine minute pitch video that the judges saw. I um, hope you enjoy it. Hi everyone, my name is Brian and I have the pleasure of introducing our company, Jojo, the future of bubble tea. There are many problems and inconveniences within the bubble tea industry. These include traveling farther than preferred, drinking bubble tea made from powder, and not being able to get bubble tea whenever we want. Not to mention, bubble tea became much more expensive with final pricings ranging from $6 to $7 due to the Philly beverage tax. We are here because we believe in a future where quality boba is accessible, consistent, and affordable. What is boba tea, you may ask? Boba tea is a tea-based drink that originated from Taiwan in the early 1980s. It most commonly consists of four simple ingredients, tea, milk, sugarcane, and tapioca. But our boba tea is next level deliciousness, made with authentic tea leaves from Taiwan, organic milk, and natural syrups. The medium which we deliver our quality drink is through a completely automated kiosk. The kiosk serves four types of bubble tea, hot or cold, with the ability to customize for dietary needs. The drink delivery time is under two minutes. The kiosk is low maintenance and keeps us informed throughout the day with status updates on the kiosk and the inventory. Jojo versus the competition. Mr. Wish is the most popular bubble tea franchise in Philadelphia with 11 locations. When comparing a JoJo kiosk with a Mr. Wish brick and mortar location, JoJo has the capacity to produce 200 drinks in 10 hours. This is on par with Mr. Wish's production capacity. While our machine operates 24 seven, we recognize that people realistically purchase boba tea 18 hours a day. Therefore, our financials and three year projections are based on selling 75 drinks a day. We offer competitive pricing, consistent fresh ingredients, and convenience. Our drinks are competitively priced at $5 a cup, with cost of goods sold being $105. Even though we use natural ingredients, we still achieve 79 to 84% gross margin for our drinks. We will minimize foliage by analyzing previous sales to predict future demand. JoJo will tap into the U.S. $1.8 billion boba tea market. These kiosks are proven as a medium to deliver delicious boba tea in China and Taiwan. We will be the first to market in the U.S. We have decided to source our kiosks from China as they have a superior kiosk compared to other manufacturers. Our first location will be at the Nest, right on Broad Street. The Nest is one of the most popular, luxurious student housing locations with 450 residents. It is three blocks from Temple Campus, 
right across from the Temple Sports Complex. We've opened discussions with the Nest to utilize their first floor commercial space, which is open to the public. We have also been negotiating pricing with malls. We will conduct daily refills and maintenance during low traffic timeframes. Each refill takes one hour, which includes traveling to and from the commercial kitchen, prepping the ingredients, and refilling the contents. Our target market are young adults and college students. Our strategic marketing plan is to incorporate campus ambassadors, influencers, and food bloggers to introduce our kiosks. We will also be running various ads on social media platforms such as TikTok and Instagram. Why choose us as the medium to enter the bubble tea market? Our time to market is significantly lower than a brick and mortar location. Jojo has lower labor costs and the ability to rec recuperate most real estate investment and simply relocate. The investment needed per location is 53,000. The more capital we have, the more locations we can open. Each location will be able to break even on the initial investment in 14 months and break even on just the kiosk in nine months. The number of months needed to break even is calculated based on a conservative 75 drinks per day and calculated on all sales being Pearl Milk Tea. Pearl Milk Tea has the highest cost of goods sold. In other words, our kiosk might have higher traffic and will be selling drinks that have higher gross margins. The net income per year is $41,733 per kiosk. We anticipate net income to be much higher as there might be more demand per day and lower operating expenses. The five months in 2021 and the entirety of 2022 is mainly aimed to break even and to generate enough capital for another kiosk. By the end of Q2 2023, we will have enough capital to purchase a second kiosk. We will purchase a third kiosk at the end of that year. In 2024, we will be able to launch a new location every three months. These calculations are based on the initial investment of only one machine. This financial forecast uses the income generated from the first location to break even and to purchase the next kiosk. With multiple locations in operation, the growth will be exponential. Some main highlights on the timeline include the finalized sale of the kiosk in June and the launch of our first location in August. I am the CEO of Jojo. I am a junior from the Fox School of Business, majoring in accounting and MIS. I spearhead the planning and logistics, finance, and communication with my partner manufacturer. Due to my language capabilities, I have the capacity to relay the company's inquiries and negotiate our terms. Dennis is the CTO. He is a senior at Penn State Abington, majoring in information systems and software engineering. He is designing the company website and will be doing most of the backend coding for the company application to operate on iOS and Android platforms. Francis is the COO. He is a senior at the Fox School of Business, majoring in MIS. He will be handling the daily operations of the company and has been working on gathering real estate leads. We plan to hire a strategic marketing intern two months prior to the launch of our first location. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to addressing any questions or concerns. Thank you. again for virtual networking after this live event. Remember to join on the Remo platform and come talk to our finalist teams and wish them congratulations. Now I want to share some other thoughts. Partnering with and supporting our alumni is one of our core missions within the IEI and it wouldn't be possible without the support of our de development and alumni relations team here at the Fox School of Business. 
Today, we're thrilled to have with us the Executive Director, Heather Procaccino, with us to help recognize some of our important Be Your Own Boss Bowl partners. Welcome, Heather. Thank you, Greg. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. My colleagues and I who work in development and alumni relations always mention to the alumnus and community partners we work with that sharing their time and talent with our students and our Temple community profoundly impact our student outcomes. Today, I have the privilege to thank, recognize, and acknowledge the over 140 volunteers that we had that worked so generously and so hard with our teams to get them where they are today. Our volunteer network consists of alumnus, industry, and community partners. As you'll see in this presentation, we had four different categories. We had our expert mentors who spent the evening prior to final submission providing very valuable feedback. During earlier this spring, our mentors spent a great deal of time coaching and providing feedback to our teams. Back in January, our reviewers spent countless hours scoring hundreds of submissions and providing feedback as well. And that brings us to our pitch coaches. Our pitch coaches spent three days in April working with all of our teams, polishing and perfecting their pitches. These individuals include Sid Amster, Greg Fegley, Glenn Gaddy, Michael Hughes, Alan Kurtzner, Marilyn McNamee, Laura Scicola, Carrie Slade, Lindsay Tabas, and Ellen Weber. It takes more than a village, it takes a community to help our students. And I wanna thank you on behalf of Temple University, the Fox School of Business and the IEI. Thank you for sharing your time and your talent and taking such a sharp interest in shaping the next generation of entrepreneurs. We could not have done this without all of you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Heather. Now we'll move on to our upper track finalists. And remember to vote for the crowd favorite at yourn.com slash BYOBB 2021. Here are the one minute elevator pitches for each of the upper track finalist teams. Hi, my name is Leonard Panzo, co-founder and CEO of Kessa Technology, a company that is transforming the way construction companies manage their business. CRMs are essential to growing and running a company in today's world. Yet in the construction industry, a very small amount of companies use a CRM. And the alternate system, uh, method that they're using to track their information and data is either inefficient, inefficient or very painful. We wanted to change this. So in collaboration with the construction uh, industry, we developed 
a collaborative platform that enables our customers to manage opportunities and accounts, coordinate and work on proposals, and use their data to make better decisions and win more work. For more information, please visit our website, www.kiesatechnologies.com. Thank you. We use tens of web applications daily, applications that rarely talk with each other. People resort to manually copying and pasting data between them, simply because they lack the knowledge or tools to do otherwise. It's a waste of time, frustrating, and error-prone. The cost to the business is huge, 1.8 trillion opportunity costs, 3.1 trillion data errors costs, low job satisfaction, and high turnover. At Simply Flows we help businesses free up precious resources, so they can focus on what matters most to them. We are building a future where applications are connected and work together, rather than in silos. We believe that trading busywork for automation means more time for creativity and innovation. Knowledge workers can easily set up their processes. No coding or IT experience is needed. Don't believe it's that easy? Give it a try at www.simplyflows.com. Hey everyone, I'm Justin Sluzarski, CEO and founder of Carbon. I'm really excited to present at BYOBB and share our mission with you. Our mission is to educate and empower responsible consumerism, making it really easy to find and support businesses that are actually making a positive environmental and social impact. We're building this trust with our Carbon Score plus Impact Toolkit. 80% of businesses are feeling pressure from consumers and regulators to be more sustainable, and we're helping them solve this challenge. We have already reduced over 200 tons of CO2 and plan to reduce 999,000 more. So this Earth Day, come join us. There will be over 1 billion people around the world fighting back against climate change. And our mission is to join forces to create positive climate action every day. Thank you. And there you have it, four strong ideas. And in contrast to our first group of finalists, all four of these companies are using software as a service and business to business models. Now for the winners in the upper track. In fourth place, the winners are Kevin Nugahali, Megan Nugahali, Alex Cheff, and Stephen Jeffers with Brain Games. Congratulations. In third place, the winner is Nelly Tacheva with Simply Flows. Congratulations, Nelly. In second place, the winners are Justin Sluzarski, Sid Del Sid, and Derek Sheehan with Carbon, which means they're our first placed winner in the upper track this year for the Be Your Own Boss Bowl is Inoke Ponzo, Gedanit It Muhammad, and Ana Ponzo with Keys Technologies. Congratulations. Would you like to say a few words? Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Greg. Uh, and I, I thank you to the mentors and our team uh, and, and our advisors, everyone who's been a part of this journey with us and are gonna continue to be a part of the journey. We really appreciate you. And we appreciate all your support. Thank you very much. Well, congratulations again to you and the whole team. Thank now you. Let's, now let's watch the nine minute pitch video that convinced the judges. Hi, my name is Yunak Ponzo, and today I would like to speak to you about Kiesa Technology. I spent the last 11 years of my career working in the construction industry. Two of those years working with subcontracted companies, and the last uh, nine working with Turner Construction, uh, a general contractor. In 2018, I transitioned to business development from operations. And although I was given a, a CRM system, I still found myself using multiple Excel sheets to track information and track data 
and to share with my project teams, with my teams. This process is very painful and quite inefficient. So I knew something needed to be done about this. I reached out to multiple people I knew that are working in construction sales, in, internally at Turner and externally as well. And what I found is that we're all experiencing the same situation and we're looking to solve, we're solving it all using Excel sheets and multiple platforms. So I knew something had to be done. I spoke to, as I spoke to a friend of mine uh, who worked for a subcontractor company, she said the same thing to me. She said, well, what about us as subcontractor companies? We don't have anything at all. We would like something like what you're talking about. And that's when Kiesa was born. And as I did more research, what I found was that although CRMs are essential to growing and running a company in today's world, only a very small amount of construction companies actually use a CRM, approximately 5%. And that number is actually um, dominated by general contractors that actually use a CRM. When it comes to the subcontractor companies, a lot less of them actually use a CRM. And this has led to companies missing sales targets, not really un fully understanding their data, which leads to poor business decisions, increased inefficiencies, as well as what I've witnessed in uh, two projects I've worked on, companies actually defaulting. We went out and spoke to about 150 people and asked them why they weren't using a CRM or they didn't like their current CRM system. And what we found was answers such as too confusing, very generic and difficult to customize, no construction specific data, and quite expensive. So we built the Kiesa business, business manager platform using input uh, from the construction industry. Unlike a standard CRM where you can do, you can manage your sales, manage relationships, track generic data, our platform does more in-depth data analysis and predictive analytics to provide our customers with a better understanding of their data and actually guide them through the process of how they can do better with their sales. Our product actually allows our customers to collaborate in the platform so they can work on proposals and share various information with one another using our system, as well as communicate uh, with our chat. And as I experienced before, most CRM systems end at an award uh, and the project team is not given all that data and information and the knowledge that was acquired during the sales process for execution. Our system enables uh, the sales team to be able to transfer all that information, all that knowledge to the project teams so that they can be able to execute according to plan. Since January, we brought in about five companies uh, to, for, to be a part of our pilot. Uh, some we brought last year and some early this year. And out of the five companies we brought in to our pilot, uh, four decided to, uh, we were able to convert them to paid customers. And currently we have five companies that are, are in our pilot. And as things are looking out, um, we're looking to convert them all to um, paid customers. And currently we're speaking with about 20 other companies that are showing interest in our platform and that we're looking to bring in either through pilot or the, as our uh, paid customer. We're developing partnerships with the VRCA, which has about 500 plus general contractors and subcontractor companies as our members, as well as StarNet Alliance, which has 165 foreign uh, contractors as members. I'm also looking to leverage my relationship with Turner. Turner is a global company all over the United States and Canada, and we're looking to leverage those relationships to be able to bring in more customers. Our customers love us, and this is what they have to say. One of our customers had to say is such, uh, after years of different CRM platforms for role of business development, this is the best I've found. So we know we're up to something good. With our platform, our customers can manage opportunities and accounts, coordinate and work on proposals, and use our data to make better business decisions as they can get more in-depth data uh, analysis and understanding of, of, of their actual data. There are a lot of CRM systems out there that are being used. And uh, although most people I spoke with say they use Excel sheets only, this is a few that I was able to compile based on what people I spoke with were using. And you can see there are two CRM systems that are set up that are specific for construction. And you can see that although there's construction specific, they do not do exactly uh, all the things that we're able to do with our platform. And why invest now? Construction technology is growing and construction companies are embracing tech. And they see that increased efficiencies actually mean more money in their pocket. And COVID has actually forced a lot of companies to collaborate remotely because we can't be in the same place. 
and investment in construction technology has actually increased from 300% by 300% from 2017 to 2018 and it's projected to continue to increase. A target market is we're targeting primarily small to medium sized general contractors as well as sub, any subcontractor company. We hope to eventually target the big general contractors such as Turner, but at the moment that's who we're targeting. As I stated before, there are about 1.1 million companies uh, potential market and about 550 companies for, that we can we believe they're in a serviceable market. And our market share uh, is about 25,000 companies. We're currently averaging about seven, 000, seven companies per, uh, seven users per company, which we uh, see that translating to about 175,000 users. Our revenue model is based on a $50 uh, per month per user subscription. And with 25,000 companies and uh, averages 175,000 users, we see ourselves uh, doing about $8.7 million per month. Our vision and growth, we're growing based on areas where we have relationships, such as Vancouver, uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Boston, and Toronto in 2021, and then uh, expanding across Canada uh, and the US East Coast and West Coast in 2022, and expand all across Canada and the United States in, by 2023. Our financials, we're looking at a at loss of 56,000 this year uh, and a profit of 600,000 for 2022 and a profit of 4.2 million in, in 2023. And a jump between uh, 2022 and 2023 in the usership is because we believe that we will have four more partnerships. And uh, as we're adding more salespeople to our team next year, they'll be able to cover more ground and, and acquire more customers. And our current customers are adding more people to the system as they find value with our platform. So we believe that this is gonna enable for us to continue to grow. And as you can see, our team is made up of uh, myself, Yetanet, Anna, Joseph, and we have uh, construction experience as well as uh, product development experience, as, uh, as you can see, and Anna who brings in marketing experience. And we also have advisors who are experts in CRM systems and founders of company as well as construction uh, experts as well. Our roadmap in January of this year, we launched our product in May. I look, I'm going full time uh, to, to go full time for Kese. And then May 2022, we're getting it's looking to come full time. And in June of 2022, we're looking to hire some salespeople to bring on to our team. Our financial ask is a $60,000 uh, BYO, be own boss, uh, full grant prize. Uh, which enable us to, to fund for marketing and sales, operations, legal, and pay for salaries for our interns that we're looking to hire for the summer. At the moment, we're not accepting any outside funding from investors. However, um, we welcome any investors that would be willing to speak with us and uh, give us input and guidance in this process. Our exit strategy revolves around being acquired. As you can see, there are some companies such as Plan Grid, Building Connected, and Pipe that were recently acquired, as well as Honest Building and BIM Anywhere. So we're looking to be acquired in the foreseeable future um, down the line by any of these companies. And with that, thank you so much for listening to me. I'll open it up to any questions you may have. Thank you. Congratulations again, Keys Technologies. As you've already heard from Heather, it takes many people in many roles to run and support our programs. Now I want to acknowledge and thank our individual and our corporate sponsors for today's event. First, I'd like to thank Steve Charles, the Department of Strategic Management, Dean Anderson and the school, the Fox School of Business for sponsoring our track prizes. And a special thank you to Bernie and Murray Spain for sponsoring our grand prize. Sadly, Bernie passed away earlier this year. He was a tremendous supporter of the Fox School, the IEI, and in particular, the Be Your Own Boss Bowl, and he will be deeply missed by the whole team. The IEI will be sponsoring the Crowd Favorite Award this year. And I'd like to offer a special thanks to our funding opportunity sponsors. Both of them are Mid-Atlantic Diamond Ventures and Robinhood Ventures. 
In our professional service sponsors category, we have Startup Tree, who provide the competition and mentoring platform, Yorn, who is providing the voting platform for the Crowd Favorite Award, and our friends at Friedman LLP for providing the auditors for overseeing the scoring and the judging. I'd also like to provide a big thank you to Milk Street Productions, who once again is helping make our dreams become a reality and come to life through this event. Thanks, Milk Street. And finally, to all of our professional service sponsors, these are our partners who provide valuable expertise through in-kind service packages to all of our finalists. And they are Fox Rothschild, Fresh Labs, RSM, NYCE Hacker House, Open Forge, KPMG, NextFab, Morgan Lewis, Amazon Web Services, Live Plan, and McCarter in English. Thank you all. We couldn't do it without you and without the support to, that you provide to our teams. Now, remember to vote for your crowd favorite at yourn.com slash BYOBB 2021. And remember, voting is going to close at 520 today. So vote now. Now it's my pleasure to introduce the Dean of the School of Theater, Film, and Media Arts, Dean Robert Stroker, who will be introducing our 2021 Self-Made and Making Others Award winner. Welcome, Dean Stroker. Thank you, Greg. It is, uh, it's just a pleasure to have the opportunity to be with you and to introduce just an outstanding alum of the School of Theater, Film and Media Arts, Nicole Marquis. Nicole received her Bachelor of Arts in Theater in 2005. And in preparation for these remarks, I reached out to some of the faculty and they remembered her as a very talented actor. And they also said, quote, who is outrageously and wonderfully funny, uh, which I think is a really good thing uh, for people to be saying about you. Uh, she's the recipient of several local and national awards, including awards from the Greater Philadelphia uh, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, Restaurant News, the Philadelphia Business Journal, and three Best Affiliate Awards. She has had just a fantastic career in the restaurant and hospitality industry since her graduation. In addition to all of these awards, she is uh, she's founder of the and CEO of nine restaurants in Philadelphia and DC, including seven locations of the very popular Hip City Veg, as well as Charlie was a sinner. She also formed Save Philadelphia Restaurants in 2020, and this is just remarkable and just uh, just a wonderful thing. Uh, and through uh, restaurants in uh, Save Restaurants in 2020. She was uniting 300 restaurants to advocate for the industry and its employees during the pandemic, which is just uh, above and beyond. Also, she's been a leader in the industry in moving all hourly employees to $15 an hour minimum wage. We are just so proud of all her accomplishments. And on behalf of the Innovation Entrepreneurship Institute, it is my great pleasure to present the 2021 Self-Made and Making Others Award to Nicole Marquis. Congratulations, Nicole. Thank you. Thank you so, so very much. Thank you, Dean Stroker, so much for the generous introduction. And thank you to Greg Begley and to the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Institute team at Temple University for this distinguished honor of giving me the self-made and making others award. You know, when I first received the email from Greg saying I was chosen as this year's honoree, I was truly humbled and grateful. And I feel so proud to be here with all of you. I remember the day I told my parents I wasn't going to college. I had made up my mind. Well, they dragged me to temple admissions and I am so glad that they did. Temple sparked my love of learning through a Shakespeare class that started my love of theater. And ultimately, 
What are restaurants, if not a form of drama and theater? It is so good to be back at Temple. I was born and raised in the Philadelphia area and anyone growing up here knows that Temple is a top tier school and a major presence in our city. My parents both graduated from Temple University as did my brother, as have so many of our team members and the most impressive people I have collaborated with in my business over the years. You are a part of a remarkable community of innovators, and leaders who are really making their mark on Philadelphia. I majored in theater at Temple and graduated with a degree in communications in 2005. Temple University provides students like us with an exceptional education and set me off on a path of self-discovery, of activism and entrepreneurship. You know, this past challenging year, has been a reminder for me that you can never give up. You have to keep pushing every single day for what you know you need. Otherwise, it simply won't happen. Persistence is key. And that's something I learned at Temple from my professors in the theater department, people like Donna Snow, Dan Kern, and David Ingram, who inspired me to try harder. Being motivated to overcome the greatest challenges and take the biggest risk is so much easier if you are very clear on your why. And for me, that's building a better world for my son and students like you and doing that by bringing delicious plant-based foods to the masses. Every day, your choice of what to eat has the greatest impact on the environment, more than how much you drive, how long your shower is, or anything else you do on a daily basis. I look forward to seeing where your temple education will take you all and how you will lead and innovate in your career and make a positive impact on our community and on the world. Thank you so much for this great honor. So thank you, Nicole, and congratulations again. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Caridwin King, co-director of the Temple Center for Hospitality Resilience, to join you on stage for some questions and discussion on your entrepreneurial journey. Dr. King? Thanks, Greg. Congratulations, Nicole, a well-deserved award. And, um, and in, in learning about you and your journey and also particularly what you've done in the last year through COVID um, and, and Dean Stroker alluded to that. Um, I've been super excited about the opportunity to have a conversation with you today and, and to share your insight about how to become a successful entrepreneur, but also how to navigate some really weird and crazy uh, experiences that the, the past year has presented to us. So kudos to you. Um, I think a great way to start this off is, is, and you sort of alluded to a little bit of the characteristics and so forth that Temple's foundation gave you, but I'm really curious to know how a major in, uh, um, in, in TFMA gets into entrepreneurship and then also too into a, a field that's probably not on the surface related, although you did allude to it. Yes, hospitality is all about theatre and performance. So can you share a little bit about how you went from that, that process um, of, of graduating to where you are now? Absolutely. You know, I always say that, you know, running a restaurant is like a theatre performance. You have your front of house, you have your audience, which is our customers, you have your front of house, you have your backstage or what we call back of house. It requires lighting and sound. It requires practice and rehearsals. Um, and it really is all about creating an experience for our customers or in theater, our audience. Um, and it's also about, also about um, tapping into your passion and your drive and wanting to serve others. And really in hospitality and um, just like in, in theater and performance, we're, we, we perform to, to please our audience and to really convey 
something that's meaningful to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and, and you said before that um, one of the things that, that has driven you is, is making sure that you have a, a clear understanding of your why. And so do you think that's where your natural connection was with theatre is all about performance and, so, and that's why it was a natural segue into hospitality for you, that that was your why about, you know, making a difference? And, and was that the lead or was it nutrition? I know that in reading some things about you, you're very, very much focused on nutrition and that has certainly driven your brands. But where was that, that initial um, focus into, into getting into where you are today with Hip City Veg and the two other two establishments? Yeah, you know, for me, my life's mission of protecting the planet and our health and that of all living creatures really keeps me going even through the absolute uh, most difficult challenges, because I know how important it is for, and like I said, like my, for my son and for future generations. So I really, when I learned that the biggest impact we can have is by changing what we eat three times a day, even eating plant-based just once a day, that that has the most positive effect on our environment and on our community and our own health. That um, I knew then that was going to be my life's purpose. And it really is our best hope of preventing environmental catastrophe and what really keeps me fired up to, to do it every day. Um, you know, that started, um, I, I moved home with my parents um, after school. And, you know, I was really, um, interested in nutrition and I had a passion for theater, but, um, and I absolutely loved um, the work that I was able to do and be a part of. Um, but when I read uh, The China Study by Dr. T. Colin Campbell and Eat to Live by Dr. Joel Furman, and I realized that plant-based foods leads to optimal health and can reverse lifestyle diseases and can reverse the environmental uh, crisis. I knew what my passion, my purpose mm -hmm. was. And when I was living with my parents, my dad was in his fifties, kind of a typical story. He, he was um, getting a little overweight. He was on four medications. He had high blood pressure and type two diabetes. And I was like, Poppy, you have got to change your diet. And He's a nurse. So he was like, I'm fine. I have a fine diet. You know, I just, it's just genetics. That's why I have to take insulin. Well, he read the same books I read and was quickly convinced to try a plant-based diet. What happened in two months was utterly remarkable. He was able to achieve normal blood pressure. He eliminated all four of his medications. He lost 25 pounds and he put his type two diabetes into remission sometime. That's what, in that moment, I knew I had to bring this to people everywhere. That's awesome. And, and I think that that really speaks to, you know, I would think one of the key attributes for success, successful entrepreneurs is not only finding the right opportunity, but if you love it, and, and give it your whole soul, then, then you can't help but be successful. And, I, and I'd, I'd like to sort of build off that in particular in relation to COVID. Um, and as we've seen, and particularly in your industry, it really did flatline us. And I think it was something that none of us could ever forecast. Do you think that um, if you reflect on, on your experiences pre-COVID as an entrepreneur, and now having lived through or living through um, COVID, other than this passion and this, this, this strong sense of knowing what's right and your, your mission, what entrepreneurial skills do you think really have come to the fore in this past year and a half that perhaps you were aware of before but probably didn't emphasise as much or things that you think, you know, coming out of, wow, I really needed to lean on that attribute and that's really what has helped our business continue to thrive? Yeah, you know, this past year really was a stark reminder that we can only get through the most challenging times together. You know, whether that's our teams, our fellow business owners, our families. And that was really apparent to me when the shutdown first happened, my nanny quit. I'm a single mom of a three and a half year old boy. 
And, um, you know, it, COVID was so scary. Of course, she could not no longer come to work. And my family and my team had to step in to help me with my son. I was working around the clock doing whatever I could to try to save the business. And my family and team really stepped in incredibly to help me. So, you know, during this time, I've seen the entire team step up as leaders themselves. It was so scary and hard for them. And it was really important for them to know that I'm doing it too with them, that we're working hard to keep them safe and that they feel that they're cared for and taken care of. Um, and, you know, I told the team, we are going to get through this and we're going to fight. We're going to keep our doors open for each other um, and for our mission. And I gave them that confidence. And once they knew I believed in them and the company, they reflected that right back to me. Mm -hmm. It fueled me and gave me wind in my sails. And it felt like we were going through a battle together. They started working harder than they ever have because everyone cared about the mission and about each other. And our strong bonds became even stronger during this period. Um, you know, walking into one of the stores and an employee, beloved employee saying to me, thank you for fighting to keep us open. I don't know what I'm going to do if I have to give this job up. That brought me to tears and it gave me the energy I needed to keep fighting. So it, it has been a reminder that you can never give up, that you have to keep pushing every single day. And um, as I mentioned, persistence was something mm -hmm. that was um, became very clear as a key to success. Um, and for me, that that's about taking care of our people and building a better world um, through plant-based foods. And I also learned that if you just do your best, the best you can do every single day, it will ultimately pay off, even though some days you might feel exhausted or defeated. And I had a lot of those days. Um, and, um, you know, and I think one important message, you know, that we talk about and it's a core value for us is having a positive mental attitude. You know, I spent years studying and cultivating how to have a positive mental focus. It's just like studying accounting or marketing or training for a sport. It requires daily practice and work. And it helps me to focus on solutions instead of getting bogged down by hardship and shock, which ultimately isn't productive. No, that's, that's awesome. And I think when you're talking about your team and how you energize them and in turn they energized you, I think that also speaks to the confidence that you had in your mission, like the, again, what we were talking about before about your passion. And then obviously you were able to translate that to your team. So that gave them something in a time of uncertainty to sort of hold on to, right? Um, but we've also seen, and you're in the restaurant industry, and so we've seen the restaurant industry probably be one that's spoken about the most as being an industry that's been affected um, by COVID. And, and, and the reason for that is, is um, because it, it leveled the playing field very quickly. A lot of people were unemployed. And then also to a lot of businesses haven't been able to open again. If you, ref if you think about your own experience and you talked about never giving up and, 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 and investing in your team, do you also think that from an entrepreneur's point of view, if you were to, to look at who's been able to survive and perhaps who, haven't, who, who has had less success, and we've used this word a lot um, about pivoting though in COVID, do you think this notion of agility really, um, COVID's allowed entrepreneurs who are very good at thinking outside the box or adapting to thrive and that, that attribute in particular has come to the fore? Um, you know, one thing I, I, you know, that you've done really well is, is your two full service restaurants don't normally do takeout, but have done it very well. And you've, you've grown and, and feel free to share with the group how much you've grown that new revenue stream, which is exciting. But other restaurants haven't been able to, to pivot that, that easily. So is agility something that was perhaps maybe underrated before, but really has come out again in COVID? Yes, absolutely. You know, for our own businesses, we had to get creative fast mm -hmm. to try to bring in some sales with everyone on lockdown. You know, on March 16th, our sales plummeted by 90%. Wow. And so we learned that 
um, in those moments, you know, looking back, we really learned that we can, what we can do is almost limitless when we know it's a matter of survival and our whole remaining team was all in on finding solutions. Mm -hmm. You know, not everything we did worked, um, but I think we were, we were just in that moment, we were really willing to take a lot of risks and some of them really paid off. Um, and, you know, for example, you mentioned the full service restaurants, you know, how would our full restaurant survive in the dead of winter with zero indoor dining? Mm -hmm. Well, we revamped the menus so they were better suited for takeout and we launched a hot cocktail menu in thermoses and gave away fleece blankets to keep customers warm outside. Well, we sold out in 24 hours and I, and we had to rush order 10,000 more blankets. So who knew that blankets would be what drew in the crowds? Right. You know, we also spent money we didn't have to build beautiful outdoor structures to protect guests from, from the elements while they dined outside in the streets. And that was a big risk. We didn't know if that would pay off. Well, we ended up with record-breaking sales those months. So what I learned is that there's a real, the, I learned about the importance of allowing my team to try new things and to take major risks because some of them will be hugely successful. But part of that was me letting them know that it's okay if some things fail, you mm -hmm. know, that, and so I wanted them not to fear failure, especially during that time of crisis when we, we really had to try anything and, and be creative. Right. And look, I think part of the remark, your remarkable story in listening to all those fantastic things that you did for your business um, was also to your contribution to the Save Philly Restaurants um, Network or uh, consortium. And so can you speak to, to a little bit about that, what that was and how you were involved in that? Because it's fantastic. And, it, you know, again, really demonstrates why you're so worthy of this award. Thank you so much. Yeah, you know, I'll never forget that day, March 16th, 2020. Um, that was the day I had to walk into each of my restaurants and tell the teams that we had to say goodbye. Um, you know, one of my line cooks, James, um, had been working with us for six years. And he is he has a family to feed. And we were barely able to keep him on, um, but we found a way. And when I walked into the restaurant after the layoffs, he thanked me and we both cried and we wanted to hug each other, but we were, we were 10 feet apart and we had to cry with each other, socially distanced. And, you know, I, I knew that my voice alone wasn't enough. We had to build a coalition if we were gonna have a chance of surviving this. So within days of the shutdown, we launched Safe Philly Restaurants with about 60 other restaurant owners. And it has now grown to represent about 300 restaurants. Wow. We knew, we, yeah, and it, and it keeps growing. And we knew we had to come together and agree on our top priorities and work together to achieve them if we were going to even stand a chance as an industry. So we created a platform and a petition. Um, we wrote letters to elected officials. We testified at countless hearings. We asked the public for support. And you know what happened? People really began to listen. Mm -hmm. And in a moment of despair, we realized that we could be more powerful and louder if we joined together. So we've advocated for the things that would help restaurants survive, like uh, expanded outdoor dining options, weekend street closures, um, cocktails to go, and of course, aid from the government. I really don't think any of us would still be here without the PPP loans. Mm -hmm. um, and, and lastly, we also got a seat at the table. Uh, we're now on the restaurant advisory committee that meets every week with top city leaders. Um, and we're part of Ready, Set, Philly, which is a public-private partnership to bring people back to Center City. 
And early, earlier this year, um, Safe Philly restaurants organized COVID testing for thousands of restaurant workers. And then most recently in March, we organized a vaccine clinic for all Philadelphia restaurant workers. And um, we have vaccinated thousands of restaurant workers um, during a time where it was really difficult um, for restaurant workers to get access to that. So, you know, we're going to keep pushing. Uh, we hope to be at 100% capacity with more and more people being vaccinated. And frankly, I wish we could move that along more quickly. Um, but yeah, it's, it's remarkable what you can do when you join forces with others. So kudos to you. I mean, that that is just so, so remarkable. As I said, when you put it in the context of your own personal world is falling apart, um, but that you can spearhead initiatives like that and have such great impact in such a short amount of time. I mean, Nicole, truly impressive. Um, and I wonder too, you know, is this, you know, you formed this coalition because you all needed something but do you think that this again moving forward where you've seen the power and coming together and this community that you've created is this something else too that you think post-covid you know this is a really good thing to keep going like this you know we, we can all work together and um and in the past we never thought this network was as important but it can be moving forward so another silver lining if you like coming out of out of the pandemic Absolutely. It's definitely a silver lining. Restaurants are typically very siloed. We have our head down in, in operations um, and day in and day out. So this definitely brought the restaurant community closer together, which is always a good thing, especially when you're trying to get through difficult times. You know, for me, it, it's sort of, you know, and for my team, almost like a second job. So it's been a lot of work to push uh, push the advocacy, but we'll continue to do it as long as it's necessary. We're hoping that after this year, you know, we return to a place where we don't need as much advocacy. Um, but I, I, um, I think there's a lot of good that came out of joining together as an industry in general. Fantastic. And so something else I want to reflect on um, that's come out of COVID or our experience with COVID, and it's, it's another initiative that you had done, which is um, being part of a support and feed um, initiative, which was, again, exposed with COVID, this food insecurity. Um, how, how important do you think for an entrepreneur it is to get involved in these initiatives that are perhaps tangentially related to your business, but they're not core to your business? I'm, I'm really interested to get your perspective on the role that entrepreneurs can play or should play in bigger society issues. And I also want to come back to um, the social justice piece, but I, at the moment, just particularly like the, the support and feed initiative. So it's about food insecurity. It aligns with the restaurant business that you're in. But you know, what role do you think entrepreneurs should play in looking for those opportunities and supporting them? Yes, you know, one of the things I'm proudest of is how we managed in a time of crisis to give back to those worse off than we were. Um, so with support and feed, we've donated thousands of meals. We've, we've donated about 10,000 meals to those affected most heavily by the pandemic. First to, um, to healthcare workers on the front lines uh, with NBA star Shake Milton. Oh, sorry. I have a little, little bug here. <laughs> flying around. Um, so first with um, Shake Milton, and he is a 76ers NBA star. Um, and at first we were going to do something before the pandemic together. He really likes Hip City Veg. So we were going to create a special shake since his name is Shake and do something mm -hmm. really fun. Um, but then when the pandemic hit, you know, he said, we've got to pivot and do something for these healthcare heroes that are risking their lives. Um, so we did that. And uh, for the last 10 months, we teamed up with artist and activist Maggie Baird, who is the mother of Billie Eilish and Phineas, to launch Support and Feed in Philadelphia and DC. And almost every weekday, we donate plant-based meals to the community. We also donate lunches three days a week to five and six-year-olds at the Boys and Girls Club in Philadelphia. And I think what we learned is that doing for others really gives our team a sense of purpose and helps us remember that we are all connected to each other. 
And I think it really helped us all put things into perspective. And so it was a really beautiful, unforeseen, you know, um, silver lining that came out of that. I, um, or benefit that came out of that as an entrepreneur, I realized, wow, like I was trying every day to give my team a sense of purpose. It was really hard for our team members to come in when they were scared, everyone was able to stay at home or work from home, but they couldn't. They had to be in the restaurants, shoulder to shoulder, working so hard to feed the community, masks and shields and hot and nerve wracking. And, and um, what happened was when they saw that they were feeding people that didn't have enough to put food on their table for their families, that motivated them. And they said, we have to do this for our community. And so that was a really uh, beautiful outcome. That's awesome. That's awesome. So let's take it a step further. So the other thing that we saw last summer was um, that, that again, COVID um, provided us a lens into or peeled back was the issues with social justice. And in my conversations with, with small business operators in particular that have a presence on social media, there was at that particular point in time, for some of them, this real tension of, how do I respond? Should I respond? Because things like the Black Lives Movement perhaps weren't even tangentially related to their business, but what was the expectation? So I'm interested to get your thoughts on, as these issues become more prominent um, and in our everyday dialogue, what role do, should entrepreneurs have in that space? Even, as I said, even if it's not even related to their core business, where do you see that role playing um, in, in the future? Yeah, you know, we went through, all of us went through a historic human and civil rights movement and, um, and time in our lives last year. And it um, really, uh, I think, forced brands in some way to, um, to speak clearly about their values. Um, and I think... I'm really proud of, of our team. I, you know, I have a group of leaders around me that are, um, advised me really well that we talked, we really talked about it. We really, um, said, what does this mean for our company? What's, what side of history do we want to be on? And we felt like we owed it to our, our staff, to our customers to take a clear stance. And I think the, the brands that took a clear stance during that time, um, did, uh, did the best because people really needed to know um, where companies stood. And I think something that's going to last that, and that came out of that is that, you know, people right now look to brands for leadership, believe it or not. They look to companies for guidance and leadership and um, the culture of the brand means a lot. They want to buy from a, from a company that has a strong ethos and culture. So I know, you know, it's a lot for uh, a burgers and fries and shake company, you know, a lot of, it's, that's a lot of pressure for us, but I think it's, um, it's imperative now that we have a clear um, set of core values that we're willing to share with our customers. Mm. No, I think that that's, I think that's, that's really important. And I think that um, as you acknowledge that we have all, from, a, from the business landscape, gone through, just like we have in society, a lot of things in this last 12 months. And I think, you know, opportunities like you and I having a chat now provides us with the, the well, we shouldn't let, we, we should reflect. I think that's my, my key things on, on what have we done and what are we going to do going forward? Because I do think it was an inflection point um, in, in the, the social issues, but also to, um, within the restaurant industry. And so one of the, um, if, we, if we circle back to the restaurant industry and something that entrepreneurs in any industry, but, but in particular um, that the restaurant field struggle with a lot is, um, is, is, is labor. Um, and we see at the moment with all the restaurants and it's so exciting and, I, and I'm so delighted for you that business is coming back. But I think that that is, there's a little bit of stress because it's trying to onboard people back in at a time when everyone 
is trying to find good staff. And so we're seeing restaurants at the moment be a little bit creative with signing bonuses and so forth. And, and as, as, as Dean Stroker said, once again, you're leading the way. Um, you've come out and said that you're, you're um, going to support a $15 minimum wage. Um, and, and again, super stoked. But having participated in this chat with you today, I am so not surprised because it is clear that you know the love that you have for your team and the importance that you place on them is 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 second to none. So, but I do want to drill down about this. As I said, I think it's an inflection point um, because we're seeing restaurants at the moment change how they're remunerating staff to get them on board. But there's always been this discussion about raising the minimum wage for restaurant workers. And entrepreneurs have said, we operate on very thin margins. We can't do it. Um, Danny Meyer, the successful entrepreneur in New York in 2015, started to try and move in that way with his hospitality included policy where there was no tipping. He walked that back at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, he was recently talked, it was, was spoken about, about the $15 minimum wage. He supported it, but he said, maybe just not yet. But here you are saying, here we are, we're doing it, $15 from now on, not going back. Um, so talk to us about how you get the courage to do that when, as I said, all of your colleagues have said, oh, can't do that, Min you know, margins are really tight. What, what are you doing? How have you changed your business model to have such confidence to really step out there and say, "This we can do this and, and we will be successful? Yeah, you know, this last year was just such a reminder of how much we value our people and how much we really have to prioritize our people. Um, and so that's why just last week we, we made the major announcement that we're going to we're doubling the city's minimum wage at our company and giving giving everyone at least fifteen dollars an hour, um, because because it really is our commitment with our actions to show our teams how much we value them, and I just feel like it's the right time. Um, I feel like everything our our staff has been through this past year. Um, it has, has been tremendous. And I really want our teammates to know that they can really create a career at Hip City Veg, not just a job. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's so important. So it's, and I think it's truly good for people, but at the end of the day, I, it really makes good business sense. If you're a business that wants to grow and scale, what, your number one asset is your people. Mm -hmm. So you have to make an investment in that. And I really look at it like, you know, um, really as a business decision, um, it's a, it's a moral one. You know, I, I believe that um, $15 as a starting wage is extremely important for people to come in and be able to start somewhere and grow. Um, but it's also really, um, it, make, it just makes business sense to me. If I want to attract the best um, people to my team, I want to retain them. And, and if, uh, you know, I want to help people grow through, which when you take someone from a starting position and you're able to grow them to management, that's a tremendous added value to the company. Yeah, absolutely. Long-term. So I look at this from many different angles. And for me, I didn't want to wait any longer. I said, we've got to do this this year. Um, uh, it's, it's the right thing to do for our team, for our company. Um, you know, every business is different. Um, so, you know, I understand uh, there are a lot of, this might not be for everyone, but for, for us, it, it, it really aligned also with our core values. And the thing is, I, everything I've read Everything I've watched and learned along the way is that culture is what really builds a long lasting company. Mm -hmm. And the first step to building a strong culture and a foundation is for us 15 for our families. Yeah. So, again, very, very true. And, and, 
as you said, it, it, it's something that's been around for a long time. And we, again, in the hospitality industry, we always talk about the value of our, our, um, our team members because we can't deliver the hospitality experience without them. But the values that you talk about, we have to show those values too. And then it does, in turn, will pay back. And, and so, again, congratulations for you on, on making and feeling confident. And, and I think, you know, that confidence that you're exhibiting in being able to do this stems right back to the start of this conversation when you talk about your passion and having a purpose. And I think that that's really important um, and that you see in successful entrepreneurs is very, very laser focused on what their intent is and being able to share that and, um, and that energy with, with their team. So I think that's really wonderful. Look, Nicole, I've really enjoyed chatting with you today and, and learning so much more about you. And, um, and I, the more that I learn about you and the things that you've done, I couldn't think of a, a more worthy recipient um, for this award. I wish you and the restaurants every success as we get back to um, the normal way of life. And, and again, I think if I speak on behalf of, of my colleagues at Temple, we look forward to continuing to watch what you do on, on both within your business and within the broader community, because I think you just have such great impact. So congratulations again, and um, thanks for taking the time to have a chat with me. Thank you so much. This was such a pleasure and an honor to be here with all of you and to receive the award. Thank you so much. Terrific. Thanks, Nicole. Back to you, Greg. Well, I want to thank Dr. Carradin King for hosting our discussion with Nicole this afternoon. And congratulations again to Nicole on being the recipient of the 2021 Self-Made and Making Others Award. And I echo Dr. King's comments. Uh, we, we couldn't think of a more deserving person. That's why we chose you. So congratulations. Now it's my pleasure to announce the winner of the Crowd Favorite Award. It was close this year, but our winner of the Crowd Favorite Award for 2021 is Simply Flows. Nelly, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you everyone for your vote. <laughs> and special thanks to my family and friends, many of them staying past midnight to support me in this wonderful moment. I'm so lucky to have been part of this experience. Thank you, everyone. Congratulations again. All right, and now um, it's time for the big announcement, and that's the announcement of our grand prize winner. And to do that, I'd like to welcome Dean Ron Anderson, Dean of the Fox School of Business and the School of Sports, Tourism, and Hospitality to join me on stage to announce who the grand prize winner is this year for the 2021 Be Your Own Boss Bowl. Thanks, Greg, and, and my apologies to everybody. And thank you to the Innovation and Entrepreneur Institute for hosting this afternoon's event. The Be Your Own Boss Bowl is the flagship program of the IEI, and it's easy to see why. Since its inception 23 years ago, the event has grown to become one of the most lucrative pitch competitions in the nation. We talk a lot about educational innovation here at the Fox School. It's one of the four pillars that guides our strategic plan. This event is one of the best examples of our commitment to that pillar. All of you are innovators. That's what has led you to develop a business concept from start to finish and bring it to this pitching platform. Just being a participant in the BYOBB is a huge accomplishment and all of you should be immensely proud. Even if you do not win today's competition, I hope that you will still continue to pursue your entrepreneurial dream. If you talk to any successful business person, they will tell you about the challenges that they faced on their road to success. A loss today is just a setback and a minor one at that. As I mentioned, just being here is significant and it also shows just how close you are to taking your vision to the next level. With that said, I know you've heard a lot from a lot of different speakers today, and I know that we're eager to learn exactly who is today's big winner. So without further ado, I'm pleased to announce the grand prize winner of the 23rd annual Be Your Own Boss Bowl. Drum roll, please. And the winner is 
keys technologies. Congratulations to Keys Technology and all of this year's participants. Congratulations, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. We really appreciate it. This uh, this means a lot to us as a as a team, and uh, we're really looking forward to working uh, with Fox School of Business with Greg and the team there. I, I'm looking forward to coming back to Philly in the, in the couple two in a couple weeks, and and really. Uh, meeting up with the team. So thank you all. Thank you to the KSA team for the hard work that you guys have put in and uh, for all the mentorship and, uh, and advisors uh, that have helped us to get this. And uh, we're really looking forward to, to doing some big things. And uh, this little guy also just wanted to say hi and thank you. I know, Greg, you've met him on some of our calls. And here he is again. He wanted to be a part of this. So thank you all. Really appreciate it. Congratulations, Anouk. It is great to see a, a team as dedicated as yours uh, win the grand prize this year. Well, that's it for our, our uh, announcement of winners today. Um, we're almost done. I wanna say uh, it takes a lot of people that deserve a big thank you for making a competition like this possible. We've already thanked the judges, the mentors, the reviewers, the sponsors, but you all deserve a big thank you again. So thank you from the bottoms of our heart um, and then finally, I want to thank the people behind the scenes that make this entire program and an event like this happen. Uh, all of my colleagues at the IEI, uh, Lindsay Clark and Aaron McShay and their team of student facilitators did a tremendous job handling all aspects of this program down to every detail. And special thanks to Milk Street Marketing again for doing a fabulous job of bringing our virtual event to life. Finally, thank you to the streaming audience and our, our watch parties that took place tonight. Um, and for people who've supported the programs and our entrepreneurs at Temple's Innovation and Entrepreneurship Institute, they need your support and we need your support and you've been there for us. So we wanna thank you again through this past year. Lastly, I wanna remind you, join us right after this on our Remo platform. Make sure you come out and meet the teams. You can talk to them personally at their tables, congratulate them, learn more about their ventures, find out how you can help them. So with that, I'll say good night from the Be Your Own Boss Ball live at the IEI. Good night, everybody. <laughs>